All right, welcome back. We are ready for the second week, and uh, we start with uh, Enrico Payer, and he's going to talk about inflation. Good morning to everyone. Uh, maybe before I start, I have to say that I got a bad cold three days ago, so I don't know if my voice is going to disappear during the lecture, but please do tell me if you cannot hear me from, uh, from the far side. Um, uh, I'm really glad to, to be here. Actually, this is a school that during my PhD I attended every single year, and I loved it so much that I eventually ended up doing cosmology even going on, so it's really nice for me to be back here, so I, I thank Paolo for organizing it. Uh, and for being here. So what I'm going to discuss during these four lectures will be inflation, and this is the plan of the four lectures. I'm going to start with the first one with some motivations why, why we would want to study inflation, and then discuss uh, mostly the background properties, uh, the kinematic properties of inflation, and that, that is the sitter space-time. And then sl slowly we will get to some dynamical uh, discussion of what inflation is. So that will be the first lecture. Uh, the second one will be going into slow roll and some approximation to try to solve the dynamics, uh, discuss what happens if there is more than one field relevant, and, and finally I'll go into perturbation, which is uh, you know, where the interesting part lies. This is where inflation connects with every, every other probe, every other cosmological probes from, from CMB to large scale structures. And so I'll just introduce the notation that I need to do perturbation theory. In the third lecture I'll discuss uh, what is really the the magic that, make, that allows inflation to talk to every other cosmological probe, and that's the existence of some conserved quantities, which are these adiabatic modes, so I'll try to stress that point. And I compute the, the, the first observable that you would want to know, which are the power spectrum of scalar and tensor perturbations. And finally, the fourth lecture will be some slightly more advanced material. I'll try to cover some phenomenology, maybe... Uh, uh, amplitude of tensor modes, isocurvature modes, running, and then spend most of the lectures on uh, non-Gaussianity. And uh, if you have any questions, please do, do interrupt me. I'm, I'm happy to, to have an interactive uh, uh, lecture. That, that's great. So motivations. So, so some motivations are more practical, some are more philosophical. The first philosophical one is that inflation is really a bridge across energy scale. It allows you to measure some sub-electron volt, like a lot sub, actually sub-milli-electron volt photons, and connect them to the physics that takes place at perhaps 10 to the 12 GeV, or maybe even the Planck scale, as we might, uh, we might discuss. So that's amazing. No? There are very few cases in which you can make low energy measurements and then say something about very high energy physics. Uh, this is a pretty unique fact, and it's perhaps one of the things that draws me to this field. You can really talk about, uh, uh, inflation allows you to talk uh, in a way that can be tested with observations about the frontier of our knowledge of uh, what uh, uh, theoretical, theoretical uh, fundamental physics. So in some sense, you're really trying to discuss uh, quantum field theory plus GR and you want to discuss them together and to make sense of what, what it means to quantize fields in, in curved space-time, and you get things that you, you can measure in our, uh, in our telescopes. Uh, so this is why I think it's, it's so cool to study it, and this is why people coming from high energy are interested in this field, but also people coming from the observational side. And perhaps you might learn and maybe have, have a hint of some of the properties of, uh, of quantum gravity, which, which goes beyond this perturbative... Uh, uh, synergy here. And finally is that uh, <coughs> inflation is really a way to discover <coughs> is a way to discover new physics. No, that's, uh, oh yeah, thanks. This is going to be tough. It's a way to discover new physics. Right? Accelerators, what we do is we smash particles together and we see if we see new particles or new energy scales. Actually, just by studying uh, large-scale structure and the CMB and thinking about those observations, interpreting them within the framework of inflation, we have already discovered at least most likely a new field, the infladon, and most likely three new energy scales. And by new, I mean three energy scales that we don't see in any way how they are related to the energy scales that appear in the standard model. So this is, if you want, it's a, it's a new physics machine, and it has already worked. It has already given us 
new physics. We know that there is something beyond the standard model. It's not just dark matter, not just dark energy, even more. There has to be something that has to do with, with inflation. Yes? Uh, three mass scales. So there is going to be an energy scale E1, and I'm going to show that's related to the Hubble constant during inflation. Another one, E2, and that's going to be related to the fact that this Hubble constant cannot be constant, has to change, otherwise inflation doesn't end. And then there is a third one, which has to do with the second derivatives of this quantity. And I'll show you that we have actually measured each one of them uh, separately. Well, this one, we don't have a number, but we know it's not zero. So we need to have at least three new energy scales. Well, here I have normalized this energy scale with the first one to make it dimensionless. So in some sense, you can ask uh, this quantity here, whatever number it is, uh, where does it come from? Does it come from the mass of the W? Probably not. If, if you try to make it come from any other uh, standard model scale, you, you just don't see it appearing. So you need some other way to generate uh, this, this scale in physics. It doesn't come from condensed matter. It doesn't come from anything we know. So in that sense, it's new. And I'll try to tell you why it's, it's at least three of them. Very good. Some other questions on the motivations or, or, or challenges? Or? Okay, so, so this is why I find it cool. Okay, so now I'm gonna get, with, with, get on with the real, real stuff. So there are two type of, uh, I'm gonna organize motivations in two ways. One is kind of the, I call them old, just because in every single textbook and probably every cosmology class you have been to, this, this has been discussed and they're very important. And so I'm also gonna mention them, but I think Barbara already discussed them in quite some depth. So I will be a little bit br more brief on this. So the old Big Bang problems. Old in the sense, as it will become clear in a second, you do need very precise measurements of perturbations to state these problems. Um, okay, just to set the notation, I'm gonna think that we work in uh, lambda CDM. It doesn't really matter if lambda is 0 0.7 or 0 0.69. Okay, you all know what I mean when I, when I refer this as the standard universe. And uh, of course, I'll have in mind some FLRW metric. And most of the time, uh, but not always, uh, I'll consider it flat. But since it's not always, uh, Right, uh, the, the curve, the FLRW matrix. So just, just to set the notation. Okay, so what are the standard, the standard problems one encounter? One, I think you already discussed it, is the flatness problem. Um, so and the flatness problem is the question, why don't we see our universe to have some spatial curvature? Fact is, we don't. And in fact, we can, uh, we can define a quantity that represents uh, the difference uh, of all um, the sum of all the energy density of the constituents of the universe we know. So this omega dot, if you want, is the sum of rho over rho critical, where I goes from uh, neutrinos, photons, baryons, dark matter, dark energy, and everything you, you can name. Everything you put it here, you sum it up. And then you compare it uh, with the measurement of the accelerated expansion of the universe. Sorry. Take, take back what I said, with the expansion of the universe, with the measurement of Hubble, okay? That's something you can do locally. You can say how much does the universe expand, and you can see whether this thing sums to one, okay? If it doesn't, everything else, because of general relativity, so we need to find the solution of general relativity, has to be attributed to another component in the Friedman equation, which is curvature. So just to remind you one way of writing the Friedman equation. Okay, so if the sum of this doesn't sum up to Hubble, then there, are, there has to be some curvature. Um, this is what I'm calling omega k. Uh, and this quantity is small. Actually, it's compatible with zero. Very compatible at, at zero sigma. And there is a small error bar. Um, okay, well, that's, that's not a big deal uh, taken like this, except that if you write down what omega k is, well, that's some constant divided by A over H squared. And so it's useful to, to define what this uh, one over AH quantity is. 
and you probably already have, but I thought I would set the, the notation. That is the commoving Hubble radius. By commoving, I mean uh, uh, every time I say something commoving, I mean that if you multiply it with an A, you get the physical one or the proper one, okay? So I'm just using the, the rubber band coordinates on this expanding rubber band without the, the factor of A. And of course, this is one over Hubble, and then if I put the A, it becomes commoving. How does this quantity depend on time? You guys probably know very well. I can just uh, get it from uh, solving the Friedman equations. And for a, for a ge generic fluid with an equation of state P equals W rho, the time dependence of this quantity there is a 1 over Hubble uh, 0 just for dimensional reason. Okay, so this is the time dependence. Actually, this is the A dependence. The dependence of the scale factor depends, of course, on what you put in this universe. And if we put something which has an equation of state uh, parameter W, well, this is the solution of the Friedman equation. Uh, okay, clearly you notice that something interesting happened when W is bigger or smaller than uh, minus one third. That's when this exponent is positive or negative. Uh, in particular, if W is bigger than minus one third, as it is the case if we have radiation, dark matter, baryons, and pretty much every ingredient of the standard model except for dark energy, but that's anyway relevant only at late times, then this quantity grows. If this quantity grows, that means that omega k grows. So the question is, uh, if it has been growing for such a long time, it has been growing as long as the universe was dominated either by matter or by radiation. So why is it still so small, actually compatible with zero? This is one way of formulating a question. Now, the, what are the answers to this question? Well, logically, there are two possibilities. Either it was really small at the beginning, and it just grew and grew and grew, but it started so small that now it's still relatively small. That's option number one. OK, so that seems to require some fine tuning. You need to start with something anomalously, no, uh, anomalously small. In fact, you could ask, what was omega k during Big Bang nucleosynthesis? We think we understand very well the laws of physics during Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And this was of the order of 10 to the minus 16. So it seems uh, a very fine tuned value of this quantity. OK, so if you move beyond that, you say, well, maybe there is a physical mechanism that makes, uh, that makes this quantity small. So the option zero is tuning. Option one is that a mechanism. And, and obviously a mechanism is W smaller than minus one third, because that's when this quantity decreases. Yes. Sorry, if I, uh... yes, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and this is what we will actually uh, advocate, that this is the, the resolution, and this is what inflation does. Finally, let me mention, maybe for, for the people that like debating or discussing, that there is a, th a third possibility, logically, just k was zero to begin with. Strictly speaking, within general relativity, there is no sense in which uh, uh, k is, is a physically normalizable perturbation. You cannot perturb it away, even if you, if you kick a little bit the system, it's not going to go from k to 0 to k different from 0. Um, that's an option. If we try to understand the general relativity a little bit within uh, maybe a, mo a broader context, maybe within an ultraviolet finite theory of gravity, maybe string theory, or maybe try to quantize this, it is possible that this uh, more UV theory will have perturbations that generate different values of k. And then this one seems, again, a fine-tuned value. Just to mention an example, if we have bubble nucleation, for those of you that, that know what this is, when you nucleate a new universe, the new universe has to have a negative curvature. Zero is not allowed by the symmetries of the problem. In the following, we will take uh, uh, option one to be the solution. There is a phase of accelerated expansion. Sorry, I should have said this is the same as accelerated expansion, as you probably by now know. Uh, in the early universe. This is what this uh, flatness problem tells us. OK, you can uh, ask questions about the flatness problem.
Okay, this one, I, I think that Barbara already discussed this one as well, but I'm gonna just say it very quickly just to set the notation about two other important uh, length scales in cosmology. This is the particle horizon problem, sometimes it's called the horizon problem. I just want to be sure that we don't confuse the hor particle horizon with the co-moving Hubble radius, so that's why I'm spending this one minute writing down the two definitions. Um, So in general, we can, we can define this. You need some water. Then we can define a co-moving distance in an expanding universe. As you might imagine, it's hard to define distances in an expanding universe because it takes some time to go from A to B, so it's unclear which scale factor you should be using. <laughs> the way to define it is to ask in how far does a photon travel that travels from A to B. This is this co-moving distance, so from time, time, time one to time two, and here I'm using conformal time. Well, this is just trivially the integral in the tau since a photon has uh, the property of being null. And of course, I can compute this quantity the same way that I did before. And if I do the integral, what I find <coughs> is this quantity. Um, okay, so again, there is the same uh, Did I screw up the minus sign here? Minus, yeah. yeah, it's a plus, no? W is zero Thing is minus one half should be plus one alpha because h goes like a to the three alpha. Okay, sorry, I did screw up a sign there. Uh, okay, so you see that this is the solution of the, f this is a very different quantity. This quantity depends of a full integral over time, while the moving Hubble radius is just something that you tell me at a constant time. I take a constant time hypersurface and that's the Hubble radius. Well, this is an integral. They do happen to be related in the case uh, well, somehow because of dimensional reason, there is a one over AH which is the same there, but the coefficient is completely different. In particular, one can use the co-moving distance to define the particle horizon. The particle horizon is the furthest at, a, at the fixed time that you can have had contact with. Particle horizon. And so that's the same as the co-moving distance, but where I take the initial time to minus infinity. So you're asking what is the, the distance between me and, and, and something, given that we have had all the time of the universe uh, to get in contact. That's the furthest that you can have uh, causal correlations with. The furthest point you can be causally correlated with. Uh, and this quantity, well, you can compute it just from here, and you can see that if uh, it diverges if W is smaller than minus one-third. Well, if it, if it is not, it's pretty much given by uh, a quantity which is of the order of the, of the co-moving Hubble radius, but with a different number. Okay, so the particle horizon is a different concept from the, the co-moving Hubble radius, but it's a concept that is relevant for us because we would like to, uh, to consider only uh, causal mechanisms, so we don't want to assume that two points that are outside each other's particle horizon know about each other. We prefer not to do that unless we are obliged to. 
So suppose that you're standing in this room and you look in two opposite directions and you see objects at some distance z, where z is the redshift of the light that they send to you. And for simplicity, let's assume both of them are at some redshift z. Okay. Um, good. Well, you can ask, uh, what is your moving uh, distance from those two objects? And you can ask how that distance relates to the particle horizon at the time in which uh, that light was emitted. So we're going to take that ratio now. So we're going to take the moving distance uh, between uh, us now and this object at redshift z, which I'm going to call chi of z. And we're going to divide it by the particle horizon. I'm going to call this particle horizon for clarity evaluated at that same time. So this is an integral from the beginning of time until the time in which those photons were emitted. And I'm going to compute this ratio. And this ratio, if you compute it, is uh, something that grows with redshift. That means that if you observe any object, in fact, at any distance, but of course, we are going to believe redshift only if you observe cosmological distances. That's where you know, velocities are really dominated by the Hubble flow. So let's suppose you observe a galaxy at redshift one in one direction and in the opposite directions. When those photons were emitted, those galaxies were outside of each other's particle horizon by a factor of two square root of two. If you go crazy and observe something at redshift 1100, for example, that could be the CMB, well, those photons were, you know, many orders of magnitude outside of each other uh, particle horizon. So it's very strange if you find out that they have the same temperature. On the other hand, it does so happen that the, the temperature of the CMB is the same everywhere in the sky, plus or minus some quantity of the order of 10 to the minus 5. Um, and this is the gist of the problem. This seems strange. Notice that this whole problem started because I was assuming the second option, that the particle horizon is some finite number in the case in which w is bigger than minus one third. This is what happens uh, with all the things that we have in lambda CDM except for lambda, let's say in CDM, but that's relevant at late time, so it doesn't matter. So the resolution of this is again obvious. We need to assume that early in our universe there was a phase of accelerated expansion with some uh, constituents of the universe w smaller than minus one third. So I would not be surprised if most of you had already at least heard this argument in, in one way or another. So I thought I'd try to um, just to mention them passing by. But I would like to mention two, two other arguments for, uh, to understand. So, so here we, what we argue is that there should be a phase of accelerated expansion in the early universe. But we don't know much more about that. Now we get two other pieces of evidence that I think are very useful. The first one, I'm going to call it the... So actually, I'm going to call this thing, uh, if you want, new problems. And in some sense, these problems are really related to perturbations, so to the perturbed universe. There, I never used the letter x for position. No? Everything was homogeneous. Perturbed. Let's see, problem number one we get when we observe the cross correlation of temperature and polarization in the CMB sky. Okay, so we have the CMB sky and at every point you can measure a temperature as function of direction. But of course, so this is the CMB sky. Of course, this is photons that you're observing. So at every point you can also attach a little vector that represents their polarization. And so you can define uh, a vector field over, over the sky. And what you can do, of course, is can, you can correlate temperature with this vector field that I'm going to call E. That also depends on the direction. And people have done that. People measure the CMB, so they have, they have made this plot. Uh, they do it in Fourier space. So L is the Fourier of angle, if you want. Form of angle. Actually, it's the spherical harmonic transform of angle, but for simplicity, we will think in the flex sky approximation that this, the sky is just a plane, and so L is just the Fourier transform of the angles. 
Um, okay, so let's plot it. I mean, I have a picture, but I think it's, it's relatively simple to plot. And I'm only gonna care about this part here, where this is L of, uh, let's say, 150. And so this is the correlation between T and E. So this is something like the power spectrum. I'm gonna define it in a second. This is what is measured. So there is an interesting regime on very, so these are large scales. Large scales in, in, in the sense they are very large uh, angles in the sky in which the temperature and the polarization are anti-correlated, okay? So this is a minus and this is a plus. Uh, does that tell us uh, something? Yes, it does. So let's convince ourselves about what it tells us. And I'll, I'll argue that what it tells us, I should have written it as the title, is that super horizon perturbations are coherent in a way that I will define in a second. So that's maybe the title of this. Uh, coherent. And I've said super horizon, super Hubble. That's the title of this problem, if you want. Okay, so let me explain what, what do I mean. So we are saying that we are measuring something. This is the Fourier transform of temperature. And the, if you want the spherical harmonic transform of polarization. Uh, this is related to this CL. And uh, I'm gonna tell you without giving you a big justification, the fact that temperature, you can think of it uh, pretty much as the density of the electron, baryon, photon, plasma before uh, recombination. Okay, so we have the CMB, it's, it's some plasma with uh, mostly photons and some electrons to keep it in equilibrium and some protons to give it a mass. And the temperature is a proxy for the density. Okay, this is extremely rough. I'm neglecting some relativistic corrections that can be put into this model, but I don't do so because I don't think they add to this argument very much. While the polarization, you can think of it as being the gradient of the velocity of this fluid. This is extremely rough for people working on CMB. What you can do is that you work out the transfer function analytically for temperature and polarization, and you will find several terms here. Here you will find a monopole, a dipole, integrated Sachs-Wolf, and here you will find the dipole term mostly. Okay, so that's for the expert. For the non-expert, this is what, what you should think of. <coughs> Okay, so what we are finding from this quantity is that the, uh, the correlation between density and the gradient of a velocity in a plasma is smaller than zero. What, what does that tell us about, uh, about this plasma? Well, the simplest way to understand it is, is write this plasma in the simplest possible way that you can think. Let's just uh, take a single wave. So this plasma is just um, cosine of omega t plus a phase. Uh, e to the i kx. Now, there is one wave of this plasma. Since I'm doing linear physics, I can consider the waves one at a time. And this is oscillating with some amplitude and some uh, phase. And omega is the frequency. What do I know about the gradient of the velocity? Well, I know it from the continuity equation that has to be the negative of the time derivative of the density. This is because the density in, in a certain volume can grow only if something flows in and it will decrease if something flows out. This is what this equation tells you. Okay, so this is just a computation. A omega sine omega t plus phi. Good, okay, so let's compute the correlation of this. Uh, delta V. Well, one first thing that we have to say to compute correlation, it means we're averaging over all the whole possible ways that the universe was. So in some sense, we expect that the two integration constants in this equation, which are the phase and the amplitude, they are stochastic variable. I'm not gonna say something about the stochastic property of A. Let's assume that A, A has some stochastic property, and this is, would be the average over A. That is not gonna be relevant for the argument. What I wanna focus your attention on is this phase. Let's suppose that different realization of the universe had the phase which is uh, random. It just, it, uh, it, it's uniformly distributed between zero and two pi. 
Okay? There is no correlation among the phases. Then the way to compute this would be to do an integral in B phi over 2 pi between 0 and 2 pi of the product sine of omega t plus phi cosine of omega t plus phi. And this quantity is, of course, zero. If I assume that the phase is just uniformly distributed between zero and two pi. Okay, zero is not a negative quantity. So if, if, if I expected that different realization of the universe, they just came with whatever phase they felt like without knowing about each other, here I would expect uh, something close to zero. Instead, they don't. Instead, it seems that because the correlation is negative, this phi is not random. This is what I call coherent perturbations. To tell you why they are super Hubble, I need to, I need to convert this L into, uh, uh, into a, a distance scale and to convert it. Uh, well, you can use the formula that L of Hubble at the time of last scattering is of order of the the moving distance to last scattering times k, and so you find that this corresponds to 70. So this L was just a twice as short as the Hubble radius during last scattering. Okay, so last scattering is what we are observing when we observe the CMB, and this scale just entered the Hubble radius uh, one, one Hubble time uh, before. So they are almost in their pristine configuration as they were outside of the Hubble radius because they just entered. They didn't have time to be, um, to be evolved and changed very much by the local dynamics. So everything smaller than 70, which is probably here, is really super Hubble, strictly speaking. Everything a little bit larger is of order Hubble, okay, within a factor of two. So what this quick calculation tells us is that Probably perturbation of order Hubble or super Hubble, they must be coherent. They must all have the same phase. So something should have set them up in such a way that they have the same phase. Uh, let me tell you something even more. What, what phase is then? Well, that's the following phase. I think you can have a non-relativistic analog, which helps, although you probably want to work out the relativistic model for yourself. Imagine that there is a distribution of of density um, that has a peak, maybe because there is a galaxy. Okay, the galaxy is just a drawing. It's not really a galaxy. It's a, some, some high density thing. Uh, your your, your large-scale structure intuition tells you if there is a high density, things are going to flow in, right? So that means that the, uh, the correlator between delta and the gradient of V is negative in an over-density. And if you take an under density, things are going to move out. So that delta is negative. So now here, delta was positive and the gradient was negative because things are flowing in. So this was negative. If you take an under density, delta is negative, but then the gradient is positive. So again, this quantity is negative. This is exactly what you would expect from gravitational dynamics to do. But those waves, they just entered the Hubble radius right now. So gravitational dynamics did not have time to tell them what configuration they should take. So whatever set up those perturbations knew about what the growing mode is, what is the, the typical way in which things grow. This is the, the, the only mode that survives at late times. More technically speaking, when you solve second order differential equation, you have two solutions, and one of them is bigger than the other as time goes on. This is what we call the growing mode. Those perturbations were in the growing mode. What this argument tells you is that Perturbations probably are of primordial origin because on scales that are bigger than the Hubble radius, they already knew about each other, they had coherent phases, and they already take the form of a specific growing mode. So that's an important piece of evidence that tells us that if we probably implement this phase of accelerated expansion that we argue about here, probably we are also going to find the origin of primordial perturbations. So from now on, the perturbation of our universe in large-scale structures and CMB, I'm going to call them primordial perturbations because of this argument, if you want. Okay, the last piece of evidence 
is the approximate scale invariance. I'm using a little bit more advanced field theory, but not very much. What do I mean by approximate scale invariance is that if I take a field that depends on position, correlator doesn't depend, uh, doesn't change if I rescale all the coordinates. This is just a name that I give. This is what I call scale invariance. So the correlator doesn't actually depend on the distance between the points. Um, oh, okay. There is an easy way to see that the, <coughs> the perturbations in our universe <coughs> have this property. And the easiest way is to look at, uh, at the CMB. And now, oh, it's hard to do this drawing well. And now we're going to look at the TT correlation. LTT, so just at this part, and I'm going to focus on the part which is smaller than of order 70, or maybe 50 if you want to be picky. So this is going to be approximately flat. I'm going to show you that the fact that CL is constant here, sorry, what the plot actually shows is not CL, it's L times L plus 1 times CL. The fact that L times L plus 1 CL is constant is the same as telling me that primordial perturbations are are scale invariant. So that will be the last piece of evidence. <coughs> I'm going to use the for, the, for the people that know what this is, the Sachs Wolf approximation, in which I'm going to say that the temperature perturbations in some direction, they're just related to the primordial perturbation that from now on I will call R with a number. The number happens to be minus 150. Doesn't matter. Um, OK, so in a drawing, this means that if you're here and you're looking at the photon from the CMB, that photon comes from a distance that I'm, I'm going to call it moving distance to last the scattering. This is the distance. And if you look at it in the direction n hat, that's the temperature that you measure in that direction. So the perturbation of this three-dimensional field, R, at that point, this is a point here at some distance and in some direction. Okay. So the value of R at this point is related to the temperature that you would measure is from here you looked in that direction. This is called Sachs-Wolf approximation. Okay. So we can check the statement that primordial perturbations are scale invariant by just computing the correlator and seeing if it indeed depends on the distance or not. I'm going to measure, sorry, I should have said, I'm going to measure temperature in two directions, n and n prime. But because of this approximation, that's the same as taking the correlator between r at two different points, let's say this point and this point. If I correlate the this in the sky is the same as correlating R, and I'm going to see if that's scale invariant, and I'm going to show you that it is. Uh, to show you this, I, I work in Fourier space, as we always do. So instead of using angles, I'm going to use the Ls. So if I write this quantity in Fourier space, what is it? Is the integral in D2L e to the I L uh, n, and then e to the I L prime n prime. So the integral in D2L, D2L prime, and then the correlator. And I'm going to call the Fourier transform of delta T, well, uh, well that, whatever, delta T of L, delta T. Okay, so because I measure delta T, I'm actually able to compute this two-point two correlation. This one is exactly what we call... Uh, this one gives me a delta function of L plus L prime because the universe is uh, homogeneous and isotropic. 
And then it gives me uh, the CLs. This is, in fact, the definition of the CLs in the flat sky. These are the same CLs, CLTT, that I'm actually plotting in this plot. I just use the flat sky approximation instead of the spherical uh, harmonics. OK, so but we said we know what this is. We know that this quantity is equal to a constant divided by L, L plus 1. Okay, now, if I want to know what is the two point of R, whether this is indeed independent of the distance, it's equal to delta T, which I put in Fourier space. And since I told you that CL at CL times L plus times CL times L square here is flat, that means that CL goes like 1 over L square. That's what I've written here. So it's just a matter of doing this Fourier trans this integral. Okay, this integral you probably will recognize. Uh, the solution of a Poisson equation in two dimensions with a constant energy density. And if you don't, you have to do the integral with all the residue theorems, and you will find that it is a constant. In particular, it does not depend on the angle between n and m prime, as long as this CL is 1 over L squared. That means that the CMB going like 1 over L squared is the same as this primordial perturbation not depending on the distance. This is what we call approximately scale, actually this is scale invariance. Since there are a little bit deviation from 1 over L square, this is only approximate. Okay, so that tells us the last piece of information about, uh, <coughs> um, about the early universe. The first information was it has to be accelerated expansion. The second is that whatever happened generated perturbations. And the last one is that this perturbation has to be scale invariant. And now I'm going to show you, hopefully in two lines, that uh, the, the sitter space fulfills all of these uh, properties. And so the end of this whole discussion will be that we're going to assume that the early universe at the phase of the Sitter expansion. Maybe this is a good time to ask questions. Um, this is really a sum of two terms. One term you can think of as being the actual temperature at that point. And another term is the gravitational potential at that point. And this, uh, the effect of this is that if that point was low, was an over density, then there was a strong gravitational potential and the photons had to come out of it, and so they were red shifted. These two things go in opposite direction with each other, they have opposite sign. The coefficient of this one happens to be slightly larger than that of this one by a factor of one third or two thirds. So the whole thing ends up having a minus in my, in my notation for the definition of R. This is the statement that some of you might have heard, that when you see a hot spot in the CMB, that's actually an underdense point where that photon is coming from, not an overdense point. The Sitter space. Well, the Sitter space is just the choice of A being e to the ht constant. Uh, so it's an FLRW solution with a specific solution for the scale factor, the exponential. It's uh, more easily written perhaps in terms of conformal time. You know conformal time defined by this quantity. And in conformal time it takes this simple, solu uh, this simple form. But this is the same constant that appeared there. And people doing the SCFT will recognize this as a, the same as anti, the metric of anti sitter space up to a sign. Okay, this, uh, this is a lot of uh, symmetries. Of course, we know FLRW spaces, they are homogeneous and isotropic, but this has more symmetries. In fact, it is a maximally symmetric space time, so it actually it has, uh, should I, I should have said, 10 isometries. And so, not surprisingly, it has three spatial translations, three spatial translations. That's the same as every other FLRW space. But in addition, this thing has 
one dilation and three, I'm going to call them the sitter boosts. Now, the name doesn't matter so much, but this is a, for the people that love general relativity. Uh, this is a maximally symmetric space time. It has the same number of isometries as Minkowski space. Minkowski has the Poincare group, which also has 10 generators. Uh, these are the equivalent of what in Minkowski would be the boost. So I'm calling them the, the S boost. And this is the equivalent of what in Minkowski would be time translation. And I just call them dilation. The only one that interests us is this one. And this one is the simple transformation that is obvious from that form of the metric. You multiply both of them times a constant. This thing doesn't change because there are two t's and two x's upstairs and two, sorry, two tau's and two tau's downstairs. So it simplifies. Um, <coughs> I was planning on proving to you that because of this, uh, this correlator has to be a scale invariant, but unfortunately time is running out. So I'm just going to uh, leave it to you as an exercise. Use this quantity and impose, um, sorry, because of this, this one has to be, Since the space has that isometries, <laughs> any perturbation living in that space, unless there is some other breaking of that isometry, should also fulfill that isometry. So any correlator that is time independent, so tau doesn't appear, should be scale invariant. As an exercise, you should do the Fourier transform of both sides here, and then you're going to prove, therefore, that the power spectrum has to scale in this specific form. And that means, uh, if you can see it by eye, that the solution for this power spectrum is going to be a constant divided by k cube. This top property, by the way, is the same that we saw was coming from the CMB. OK, so putting all together, early universe is accelerated. It generated perturbations. And because perturbation are scale invariant, early universe uh, can is, uh, what explains scale invariance is that the early universe was the sitter space, or very close to the sitter space. And that means that these primordial perturbations have a power spectrum. Uh, maybe I should define what I mean by power spectrum. Power spectrum, I mean that the, is a correlation function of the Fourier transform. This is what I call power spectrum, where the, the Dirac delta there is just because of homogeneity of the background, and so there is conservation of momentum. And the fact that P only depends uh, on the norm of K and not on the vector is a consequence of isotropy, yes. Uh, this is uh, very good, yeah. This is uh, three plus one dimensional, the sitter space. So three space, one time. Um, and if you want to be able to, to do this calculation here, you can easily think of the sitter in D dimension as embedded inside Minkowski D plus one. And then this one, the symmetry is the Lorentz group as O D. So D plus one, comma one. And then you get the right counting. OK, so, so now we all got convinced that we should, start the, should, we should study a phase in the early universe that, was, that looked like the sitter. Clearly, after all the lectures you have had about uh, dark energy, the first and obvious solution to this is that one just put a constant, uh, a cosmological constant to the Einstein equations, <coughs> and that's it. That is part of the solution, but if we put a constant by the definition of the word constant, inflation, or this early phase of the sitter uh, expansion is going to go on forever. And that's too bad, because then we, we wouldn't exist. So inflation. 
By inflation, we mean an early phase of accelerated expansion. But in fact, we are going to impose more. We're going to ask that it is quasi the sitter. So the, the space time resembles that space time. Okay, we just said that the obvious way to do it is uh, put a constant, but then this leads to a problem is that inflation is eternal. That's not good because we know that there was a phase of matter or radiation domination in our universe. So the next good thing is say, well, let me invent some clock. I'm going to call this clock phi. And somehow the cosmological constant depends on this clock. And this clock is telling the cosmological constant after some point to turn off. Clock turns off. In fact, just to, to have a better notation, instead of using the, the symbol lambda for something that depends on the clock that can be turned on and off, I'm going to take lambda and rotate it by 180, and I'm going to call it V of phi. Better notation. OK, so now you have two possibilities for this clock. Possibility number one, you can invent some time dependence of this clock, whatever you like. And then you, you put it in here, and you get a phase of inflation that lasts as long as you want, because well, you, you just made up what this clock does. That's option number one. It sounds like a bad idea. Well, one, because you're making up things. Two, because you're breaking diffeomorphism invariance. But actually, diffeomorphism invariance are, nev are never broken. I mean, you can always uh, put, them, put them back into the theory using the Stuckelberg uh, trick. And anyways, uh, time is arbitrarily defined anyway. So the arbitrariness of this function you could reabsorb this in the arbitrariness of t. This, this approach to the problem sometimes goes under the name of effective field theory of inflation. And I think it's, it's very nice to understand the property of perturbations, but it requires a higher level of abstract, abstraction, so I'm not going to follow that approach. I'm going to follow approach number two, which is uh, this phi, this clock, comes from some dynamical theory. Since this clock doesn't have indices, that theory must be the theory of a scalar field. And so in its simplest form, inflation is studied as a theory of a scalar field coupled minimally to gravity. Second way of, of, of thinking about this. And now this, this field really comes from, uh, from a scalar field after solving its equation of motion. And that is probably going to give us some phi of t. And that will be what determines the clock that turns an on and off the phase of the sitter expansion in the early universe. And that's what we call inflation. Five minutes, no? Oh, 20 minutes. Ooh. Okay. Well, then I can do way more. Oh, well, that's so exciting. Uh, very good. Yes. Yes, for the sitter proper, it should be exactly constant. The fact that it's not exactly constant because it changes a little bit because it depends on this clock will mean that this is quasi the sitter in some sense. And I'm going to quantify what do I mean by quasi the sitter. It's like being a quasi dog. It's unclear what you actually are. So what is quasi the sitter? And that I need to make very precise to you. I'm going to do that. That's very good. So maybe some other questions, now that we have all the time of the world. <laughs> Oh, uh, so this one is the, the Einstein-Hilbert action, Einstein-Hilbert. And this has, uh, well, it's unclear why it should be the right uh, 
action for gravity, but in some sense, if you vary it and make some assumption about boundary condition, it does give the Einstein equations. So I'm going to assume that the action for general relativity, general relativity, so if you want what makes this metric dynamica, is, is coming from here. And oh, maybe I, should, maybe I should have said R is not the variable I was using before. R is the Ricci, maybe that was Ricci scalar. Uh, okay, so there is just, um, uh, and then this one is just a canonically normalized scalar field. I can actually put any number in front of it just by redefining phi. And here I can put any number by redefining V. With this property V would appear the same as lambda. So that's why there is this factor of two. Yes. Exactly. By definition of exact, the sitter, uh, oh. H is constant. So H is constant. That also means that this uh, isometry is exact. You see from this isometry that I can rescale time as long as I rescale space, and the space time is invariant. That means that arbitrary far in the future and arbitrary far in the past is the same. It doesn't change. So clearly, there is no space for me and you inside this metric. Because every time you tell me we were leaving, I do a rescaling, and I see that we are not in that metric. Yeah, very good. Another question here? Yes, I will not. That's a very good question. The first guess that you would have had is that H constant was a solution. But now I'm going to show you in a second that H, H is going to be a function of time. And I'm going to make that specific. So that, that, that I'm going to solve right now. Yeah. That, in that first point, by sense of C. Uh, well, at this point, it's not exactly the effective field theory, but it's, it's the philosophy behind it is uh, asking the question of, uh, what breaks time translation? I'm not going to try to derive that explicitly from solving some equation of motion. I'm just going to assume that it is there. And if on top of this, I'm going to write the action for perturbation only based on the symmetry surviving after I assume such a background, that would be an effective field theory approach in which, uh, yeah, you look for the most generic uh, theory that describes a system with specified uh, uh, symmetries, some of them linearly realized, some of them non-linearly realized. And I think that's a very nice approach, but I think not for the first time you see inflation. So I will, I will not discuss it very much here. Yes. Um, it is possible, accelerating backgrounds, I would say no. There is the possibility of having, so the question was whether there is any other option to generate, I guess, a scale invariance besides the sitter space? Well. All of them, yeah. Accelerated expansion, I would say, as far as I know, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I would say no, only the sitter space. Uh, I mean, okay, so let, let me say it. In this, in, in this simplest way of realizing the, the isometries, this is, I would say, the only option. There are other options. So one option is that saying that this field, the, the, the scale invariance doesn't come from an isometry of space-time. It comes from a, some other symmetry of the theory. So I can invent another action in which that field R somehow is seeing something that has a scaling isometry, even though space-time is not the sitter. I can always do that. And there is a class of solutions that have been written down very clearly, in which a scalar field enjoys a dilation symmetry that is not present at the level of space-time, but only that specific field. So that's one option. Uh, you have to organize things. Uh, perhaps the, the bad thing about that is that what solves the expansion of the background and therefore problem one, two, and three is not the same thing that solves problem four. While in this case, it's just the, the one assumption of having the sitter space that brings the whole bundle home. In that sense, it's more uh, appealing to me. Yes.
Very good question. Does the scalar field need to be minimally coupled? No, it could be anything. It could go crazy. I'm going to start with the simplest realization and study the amount of phenomenology, but people have done a lot of, uh, have studied this to death with no, minimally, uh, no minimal coupling and non canonical scalar fields and multiple scalar fields. So there is a lot more on top of this. I think the, the essence of the physics is already seen here. So that's a very good question. And I'll try to formalize inflation in a way that you can easily apply to non, uh, to actions that are not this. And there is a way of doing it using Hubble's low roll parameters that only take derivative of the metric, which as long as you assume GR should be okay. So that's a very good question. This is just, a, this is just a, it's pedagogical. This is a pedagogical way of doing it. It could be something else. At this point, we want to make the algebra as simple as possible to get the physics uh, as well as we can. And once we understand the physics, then we go crazy with the algebra and we can make more complicated theories. Very good. Something else? Okay. Let's write the energy momentum tensor of this thing. This is the variation of the action with respect to Jimmy Nu itself, so we get it nice and symmetric. Let's write down the equations of motion, also very easy. It's pretty much just the Klein-Gordon equation, box phi equals zero. But we're now box, of course, it's the, it's the generally uh, covariant box. So it has one over square root of g, d mu square root of g, g mu. Oh, there is another term. If you just vary the action with respect to phi, this is the equation of motion you find. Now, there are two ways about, uh, of thinking about this. Uh, you can think of it uh, just as a scalar field, or you can think of it as some kind of fluid. I think it's sometimes useful to have this fluid point of view, so I'm going to mention it. If I take this energy momentum tensor, and I only consider, so from now on, let me only consider homogeneous solutions. That means that phi of x and t is just phi of t. Of course, eventually I need to do much better than this because our universe is not homogeneous, but on large scales the universe is homogeneous. So as long as I describe the background, this is a good starting point. And of course, the trick will be that I'm going to next two lectures perturb around this. So this would be next time. So for today, I'm going to establish what is the background in the same way that you establish FLRW before you study structure formation in the universe. As long as, yes. Yes. Very good. Yeah, so the question is how do I know that this is a good starting point, uh, phi to be homogeneous? In principle, uh, you don't, in principle, you don't know it. What it turns out is that uh, the, those equations of motion are nonlinear because V, in general, is a nonlinear function of phi. So I just don't know the solutions. What I can do is that I can try for some simple solutions that I know, and I show you that I know some simple solution when phi is homogeneous, and do perturbation theory on top. As long as perturbations are small, that will be a well-defined procedure. When I match that to the late universe, what I will see is that uh, those perturbations become the perturbation in the FLRW universe that we measure, in particular the, uh, the inhomogeneities in density and the anisotropies in the CMB. And we know that those are small, of order 10 to the minus 5, the primordial one. So this suggests that 
that background plus 10 to the minus 5 perturbation is a good starting point. So if you want what we wrote before was something like delta T. This was related with this perturbation R, which you can think of it approximately as the perturbation phi, up to some zero parameters that I haven't defined yet. And this is 10 to the minus 5, because this is the homogeneity of the CMB. So also this perturbation will be 10 to the minus 5. I mean, this is 10 to the minus 5 when you divide by the average CMB temperature. So this is a hint of why that should be a good starting point. Anisotropies are small in the universe, and so are inhomogeneities on large scales. It is in principle possible that the fully known homogeneous early universe gave rise to a homogeneous one, but not in a way that we can compute. So people don't investigate that possibility. Some other questions? Okay, so as long as we restrict to homogeneous, actually this uh, energy momentum tensor takes a very simple form, which is the one uh, of a perfect fluid. A rho given by one half phi dot square plus V, and the pressure given by one half phi dot square minus V. And so the equation of state parameter actually changes. The equation of state parameter I define to be pressure divided by density, and that clearly depends on the particular solution that we are studying. For the expert, let me notice that actually a single scalar field is not a perfect fluid, rather it's a perfect superfluid. It has only one, one degree of freedom and not three. It doesn't have the transverse uh, part that you would find in a fluid, since the velocity is really a vector. Um, okay, so, <coughs> so we are pretty much uh, coming close to making our final point. We have the equation of motion. We make some assumption to simplify them so we can actually solve them. And that's homogeneity. So we are left with this set of equations, which are, if you want, the master equations for inflation. The first one is the well-known Friedman equation. And I'm going to assume that the universe is flat, because as we saw before, curvature is diluted by ex accelerated expansion. So if I wait long enough, it's going to be flat. That's the Friedman equation. This one is what I was calling before the energy density. And the other equation is the equation of motion for this field, uh, which is written down there in the full things, including spatial derivatives. But if you don't have spatial derivatives, it simplifies to this. So the first equation is just familiar to you. It's the usual Friedman. It tells me what gravity does depending on matter. The second one is also pretty familiar. In fact, take the simplest case in which V is just 1 half m squared phi squared then this term looks very much like a harmonic oscillator. Phi double dot plus m squared phi, where the frequency is set by the m. But there is this interesting new term. So this term has, has a name. It's called Hubble friction. Why friction? Because it comes with phi dot. And because the sign is plus. So this term always opposes uh, motion in phi. As phi tries to change, this term grows. And then uh, the, the acceleration has to decrease as a consequence. So this slows down the field always. And the coefficient 3 is really the number of uh, space dimensions in our universe. And it couldn't be different from that. Um, this equation, this is an example. But in general, this potential can be an arbitrarily complicated function of phi then it becomes clear that this set of equations does not admit uh, simple, exact solutions. In fact, for the expert, there is a trick to generate arbitrarily many exact solutions, which is the Hamilton-Jacobi formalism. And I can tell to you privately if you're curious. Uh, but more generally, we don't have exact solution of this, so we're going to have to make some approximations to find a solution. So we will look for approximate solutions. Those solutions 
will be uh, the slow roll, they are called slow roll inflation. Question? This mass, yes. Yes, very good. There are a lot of constraints. So there will be constraints on V. We will see that there are quite a few constraints on V. An obvious one that it cannot change too fast with time. If it, the V is such that it changes fast, it's not going to look like a cosmological constant. And we will quantify that in terms of number of what that means for the properties of V. That's constraint number one. Constraint number two is when we go to the third lecture and we compute perturbations on top of this background, those perturbations will need to give me precisely this delta T over T to be of the order of 10 to the minus 5. And that would be related to phi divided by some derivative of the potential. Bank somewhere. And, uh, and getting this number right will be another uh, constraint on, uh, on M. Even though it doesn't look from this expression, but that will put another constraint on the potential. So there are two types of constraints. One is that you want to get inflation. And two is that you want to get the right perturbations that we measure. But until I discuss perturbation, I cannot tell you what those constraints are. But just as a simple example, this one, well, it's almost ruled out, but typically observations constrain it to be um, 10 to the 12 GeV. So it should be equal to 10 to the 12 GeV. And even when it's that, it's already 2 sigma. should be equal to 10 to the 12 GeV, if, if this model is correct. This model is actually in tension with observation at 2 sigma. So OK, but a, a number for m, that by doing this plus this, I can get a number. And that's the number I get. And I can tell you after lecture number three how I get to that number. But I need to discuss perturbations. Something else about the background. or. Well, then in the last 30 seconds, I tell you two fun things about the sitter, besides the fact that he was a Dutch uh, theoretical physicist. But here I'm referring to the space time. So one thing about the sitter is that uh, it's a solution of the Einstein equations uh, with a cosmological constant, and that you know. One fun fact is that uh, the sitter space time is an Einstein manifold. Einstein manifold. That means that the, the, Ricci, the Ricci tensor, I think this is called the Ricci tensor, is proportional to the metric. And the constant of proportionality is easy to derive by taking the trace of the Einstein equation. And that is 2 lambda. In fact, you can do it in d space-time dimension, where d for us is 3 plus 1. But you can do it in any d. And this is the constant of proportionality. So instead of spending uh, 10 hours of your life computing the, the Riemann and then contracting and uh, getting Ricci, well, this is the solution. So it's a very simple space time. Uh, the other fun fact is that there is an invariant distance, which is invariant under all the 10 isometries of the Sittel space. And that distance between two points is given by the following formula. take two points. When we are in Minkowski, we know what we have to do. We do x mu, x nu, eta mu nu, and we get something which is invariant under uh, well, Lorentz transformation. And then if you take the difference under Poincaré transformation, 
This is the equivalent of you have to do in what, what you have to do in the simpler space to define a distance between two points, which is invariant under all the isometries of the space. So this is useful if you want to write down a correlator in terms of things that are already invariant, which you typically want to do. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for listening.